This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to just briefly introduce Jennifer Foster. Um, she's a Cassidy parent um, and a professor at UCO in their mass communications department um, and has been teaching um, hybrid courses or blended courses that involve some face-to-face, -face, but also an awful lot of online um, content and online teaching and learning um, for the past decade, at least. Um, and she, hopefully many of you have had a chance to view the videos um, that we asked her to create to sort of talk about best practices and um, some do now strategies relative to, or responsive rather, to the feedback that we got from you all um, from the surveys. It seemed like a lot of people wanted help and were concerned about how to build community um, and um, how to leverage discussions amongst our students in order to continue to make those community connections um, and how to be efficient in our lesson design, specifically asynchronous student-led lesson design, uh, how to do alternative assessments, and then how to facilitate group work, group projects, group activities, things like that in an online platform. So Wes has shared the link to the document that there's a series of questions that people have been adding to um, that are underneath each of those videos. And feel free to reference those or add your own or use the chat. The chat is also activated. Um, and we really want this to be something that benefits you. Um, and so feel free to ask questions specific to the videos or if there's something specific that you're working on and wrestling right now with um, in your own classes that you uh, want to put out there um, for conversation, um, feel free to do that as well. And then with that, I will step away and stop talking and let Jennifer take over. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so um, there are some questions in the Google Doc. Hi, Mrs. Boyer. You just came up on my screen there. <laughs> Mrs. Boyer is uh, one of my kids' fa all-time favorite teachers, so I'm happy to see your face there. <laughs> um, and, and so many of you, you know, Caleb is in fourth grade and Noah is in kindergarten, so um, I know I've had the opportunity to be an observer of you and the wonderful teaching that you do, um, and so as Sarah said, I've been teaching online for a lot of years, and since you are all being thrown into teaching online during a crisis, uh, I wanted to see if there's some questions that I could answer, some ideas that I could help offer, um, you know, just to have that conversation and to have someone that has been doing it and seen it done in lots of different varieties. Um, so I, I see that Mrs. Pryor has asked, what's the best way to engage our young students in conversations about their work? I think that this is a really important question because, um, you know, we are talking about kind of putting a college level expectation on very young students to to do this remotely and to do it at home. And we have college students who struggle with being independent learners and trying to engage and, and activate that. So um, when I read your question, I take it as, you know, that they are having that conversation that they're being reflective in their own work. Um, so I do think that when we have self-guided lessons, having, uh-oh, I've become a presenter. Let's see. Okay, we're still seeing you the same, so no no changes. Sorry to distract you there. Oh, no, it's okay. Just, uh, I don't know if that's, I don't think. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to share your screen if you don't want to or, or, or whatever. Whoops. Shoot. See, this is how I got myself in trouble in the other meeting. Okay. <laughs> Wes, I'll, when you make somebody a presenter, it automatically shares their screen. Oh, see, there you go. All right, well, <laughs> let me, um, I guess I'll just make myself the presenter. Sorry, and I will turn that off. I did not mean to break, sorry. No, it's okay. I just, um, you know, all these different platforms, are they just have different little ink. Uh, things with them, but that's okay. I will I will learn this one. Uh, okay, so I think that all really great online lessons have a reflective component to them. Um, so, you know, when it comes to our younger students, we might just ask them, you know, what was the biggest th takeaway from this week, right? What's the number one thing that you learned? And I would think about it from the point of view if you were having like a conversation with them uh, at dinner, right? If they were your own child and you were having a conversation with them at dinner, asking them what did they learn or what did they do? What was exciting um, from this week? And I know that Fridays in the lower division, 
have become kind of catch up days, or at least in fourth grade. I don't know if that's universal for for, for all lower division. I guess I should. Okay. Uh, and so I think that that might be a really great thing for a Friday activity is just a reflection, right? Where they're having to think about what was their top takeaway, what was you know, the thing that was most meaningful to them, what did they learn? Um, you know, Caleb today was struggling with adverbs and adjectives and identifying which one was which. And so I had him get onto the office hours and to have a conversation during office hours. And he was so embarrassed about that idea because he was worried every single other student was gonna be in there. And I said, as a person who holds office hours every week, I can promise you there's gonna be no one. No one is gonna be in there. And I was right, he was the only student that came. Um, but. But you know, having that conversation um, and having to be reflective, I think is one way, even with our young students, that we can get them to be more engaged in their assignments and in their learning. Um, and that could just be through a short video, right? Through that uh, Flipgrid, I think is the platform you guys are using in a lot of the lower division classes, that would be an easy way for them to just post a response. It wouldn't have to be cumbersome um, as far as a long lengthy assignment, but, but having them you know, just record themselves and their thoughts of something that stood out to them would be something that comes to mind. Um, if anyone else has a question, feel free to post it into the chat. Um, otherwise, I can move on to some of the questions that were pre-submitted. And, and I can share some of those too. So it is okay, great to hear great. Those from people's voices. And so if anybody, if you want to raise your hand, we can see, see you raise your hand. <laughs> Please just jump in. <laughs> Um, one of the ones that we we said we definitely wanted to do was really pertaining to video four that was about community connections. And so this question said, in thinking about how to gauge student engagement, what do you find is the most effective way to gather student feedback as it relates to their experiences in class? Do you have a favorite question? How frequently do you recommend seeking student feedback? And that's you kind of touched on that a little bit already with with reflections, but I will also copy this and I will put it into our chat in case you want to see it there. So other thoughts as far as engaging in student engagement? Yeah, I so in this particular video um, that Sarah was referring to here, I, one of the things that I was discussing is that I think that discussion boards are a great way for us to engage our students. Um, and I use discussion boards on almost every single learning module, like every topic. Um, I, I really enjoy discussions because students have to, you know, write their own response or do a video for their own response. But then I think that having students respond to each other is so important, that peer-to-peer -peer feedback and response. So anytime I ask students to do a discussion, I always have them respond to at least two of their peers. And that might sound frightening to open it up to allow students to respond to each other, but that's really a part of the connection that they're missing by moving to remote learning, right? If they were in the classroom, they would be discussing what someone else said or bouncing off from that going deeper into the material based off of what someone else in class already said. Um, and so I think that one of the questions that I use a lot with students that's kind of a could go with pretty much any topic is um, if you were this person's coach or if you were this person's teacher, what would you tell them to improve? So if I've given them an assignment to watch a video, a demonstration, then I might ask them, you know, if you were the teacher, what would be, you know, one thing you would tell them that they should have done that they could do better? What's one thing you would tell them that they were really great at? Um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the idea of using students as teachers, that it's a sign of a mastery level knowledge. So anytime we can engage them in that, um, I tell my students all the time that I'm a big believer in what Aristotle said, that the thorough sign of knowledge is the ability to teach. So um, I, I put them in that position to you know, show that they understand the material. But, but because before they can say, hey, you don't have a preview statement in your essay, they have to first know what a preview statement would be, right? So they have to have that understanding before they can critique it. So I think that that's something you could use in a lot of different levels uh, and a lot of different disciplines is asking them to evaluate it. Um, you're already using you know videos or you're using documents that they you know they're seeing they could even do this on their own work right after they turn in the work to you then ask them to say all right now if you were the one grading this what are two things you would tell yourself to do a better job at um, so that's one that i think that could be used um, you know through a lot of a lot of different varieties 
And I'll pitch in there, I know Simon, and then there's some other uh, middle division teachers who've used Padlet and have had some really good success with that as far as the discussion. I have not used a discussion board on my Cassidy with my fifth and sixth graders. Um, I'd be interested in if you wanna put it in chat or you can raise your hand or just unmute your mic. Uh, what are people using now for discussion discussion board. Um, one of the challenges we have with Seesaw in remote learning is that students can only see their own work unless the teacher chooses to tag it for everyone. So one of the things we've done with um, some of their, um, they've made info picks uh, about our responsible use policy, but students pick their two favorite that, and then they, then those got shared back with the whole class, but I didn't take it to the step of requiring them to respond. And so that, that sounds really good. You know, when I first heard about the University of Phoenix, I was surprised they did, and maybe they've changed this, but they were doing it at that time, in the early 2000s, everything basically via discussion group and through a very text focused online environment so is anybody having success or trying or simon do you want to say something about padlet or anybody else go go ahead if you want to chime in about what you're doing with that yeah so pretty much with padlet i um i have it where i give students prompts like questions and direction right underneath the questions as like how many sentences they they need to write and then what I like about it most is that the students can see each other's responses in live time. So I'll let them write for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then I'll call on students to uh, discuss what they wrote in at least two categories. Because so far I've had like a maximum of five categories, but I'll let them choose their top two just so that every kid gets a chance to speak. Um, the difficulty with the, um, with not with Padlet, but after I've used Padlet in classes, um, trying to I'm very used to hearing all of their voices at the same time. So like with technology, they have to sort of like wait till one person finishes and then state their opinion or make their point. So um, I think I feel like the Padlet usage is fine. It's just after they've used it. How do I kind of like, how do I bring the momentum back on screen uh, through video in terms of the conversation that they seem to be having on, 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 the, on the platform, on the Padlet platform? Awesome. I want to ask Jennifer a question, then let's have Shelly and Melissa maybe tell a little about, about Seesaw Blogs. Jennifer, I know with discussion groups, sometimes if you don't, and even if you do, try to structure it, you know, students won't necessarily refer to the text or, you know, get meaty in their discussion. They might be kind of fluffy or just simple. So do you have any tips for kind of how you set that up for students so that their responses to each other, as well as their posts, you know, are meaty and, and refer back to what they read or what they have learned in the in the lesson that they were sure. presented with? Sure. Okay. So I see Shannon's on from the science meeting on Monday, right? Uh, and Padlet was one of the tip, one of the things I suggested with you guys. And the question had been about extra login. So it does seem like Cassidy is using it. So that's that's good news there. Um, so okay. So as far as meaty questions go, or meaty answers, I think the the thing is you have to have meaty questions. Uh, if we write questions that allow for you know one word, two word answers, then that's going to decrease. Um, the response that we get from our students. So part of it begins with how we write our questions themselves um, and how we can make them more open-ended. And you have experience with this because you've written strong essay questions, right, before where, where you're looking at an exam and you're trying to write a strong essay question. Those same best practices apply here then, um, that we want students to have to, you know, get deep into the text or in their response. Um, some things that people do in this, again, this will depend a little bit on grade level. Um, one thing might be how many sentences do you require? Uh, if you if you just let some of my kiddos in my own personal house, if you didn't put a sentence number, they might not be writing very many sentences. So there's no way their response is going to be very meaty. Um, and so, you know, it might be really that, you know, part of that essential is to make sure that there would be enough questions. Um, you could also make sure that they cite some sort of example. Uh, if you were wanting them to be reflective on the novel that they're reading, maybe they have to cite the page number that that's from in parentheses afterwards um, or, or something to that effect where they're really, you know, using that detail and learning to begin to cite that source on a very basic level uh, in their answer and in their response. 
Um, but a lot, also when it comes to writing the questions, sometimes if we write questions that are um, multi-question, um, when you write the discussion post, if you set up multiple questions in there for them, ask three or four questions, then it already sets up that they have to answer three or four questions. It gives them a place to start instead of getting bogged down and frustrated. Um, they can answer each of those questions, which will take them a little deeper. Um, and um, and then being able to find that that feedback. But I do think that in Google Classroom, um, there are options for them to post a question just to the teacher, a private comment, but then also to the entire class. So if you were wanting to do discussions and not get outside of Google Classroom, I think that that would be a stream that you could do it in. It wouldn't. It would be a little clunkier, maybe just because they wouldn't be responding to each other. Oh no, I think you can at the person and respond directly to the person. Um, but but on, on that assignment, you can just allow them to post to everyone. Um, sorry, um, I've done a Google Doc before where uh, kids all pick a, a color. <clears throat> and so you list everybody's name at the top and you just highlight them and you can do that or th they can choose their color. But then that can also make it visible as far as who's responding to what. So you could set up some different questions in a single document and then ask them to respond. But Padlet is pretty nice as far as how it lays that out. And you can give them, you know, maybe six or eight choices. And then they respond, like you said, to, to four or five. Um, Shelly and then Melissa, do you all want to tell a little bit about the Seesaw blog? Because that's something that not everybody knows about and is turned on. And tell, what are you doing there? And how are you trying to get students interacting in, in third and second grade? I think um, this is the first year I've actually used the Seesaw blog because our students have been our classrooms can, you know, we have the setting can see each other's work. And so we can kind of control and see what the kids are doing. But now that we're in this remote learning situation, that was something that was definitely missing was being able to see their classmates work. Um, and, you know, everything is approved by the teacher. So everything was appropriate. But um, so we found that that was really difficult. But Seesaw makes this blog feature, which is super simple um, to set up. And that's where the students can, can post work that they want their friends to be able to see. So artwork that they've created. And then they can comment on each other's work. We have, you know, um, Max Coat, Melissa's son, created a song and he sang it on the guitar. And I encouraged him. I, I don't post to the blog, the students post to the blog. So it's work that they want in there and they want their friends to see. And so Max posted his song and, and he's getting some really awesome feedback about it. Um, and we haven't been real intentional with that yet. And this is, you know, starting some conversations in my own head about intentionally having questions. You know, I love the idea of being the teacher and how would you respond to that? You know, how could you give compliments? That's something we would be working on in the classroom. Um, in, commenting to each other it's a very intentional way of teaching kids to do that and so but i have and the students have really enjoyed the blog feature because they can engage with each other and it's still a protected environment because the teacher still approves you know comments and, and approves what they see and so we know it's a safe place for the kids i don't know, melissa how are you using it um, in a similar way, I like it because it doesn't make my feed so busy um, by tagging everyone. It's much better for that. Um, I My daily morning reflection questions, those are the ones I post to the blog. I just, when I approve it, I publish it. And they're getting better about responding to each other. So I thought, same as you, I just started thinking about ways we could use that in a more academic way. Um, my main goal at first was the connections. Um, which we can still use for that. But I think now asking questions there um, and more commenting in a more purposeful way, I think will be great. I think it's already a tool we're using, so it'll be a great way to just improve that. Brianna Titus is, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, so one thing that I do when I'm t beginning to teach people to do comments uh, and peer feedback, and this is just a little more, I don't know, it. It's, it's a little fluffier than I normally am, but I call it two stars and a wish because it's sticky. It sticks with students. Yeah. So two stars, two good things. You know, what are two things that you think were awesome? Um, and when I have them give those two stars, they have to use some sort of vocabulary or in my in my case, I, I call them speech terms, right? I want them to say, you know, your gestures added to your presentation, not just you looked good or nice job to, to use some terminology. And you might need to provide that word bank terminology for them you know, use 
you know, when you're giving your comments, make sure you use at least two of these 15 words or something. Um, but so two stars, two good things, and then one wish. And I like the term wish because it doesn't sound so critical and people are able to receive that a little bit better um, sometimes. So that's what I do, two stars and a wish. And because we know from research, you have to give twice as many compliments as we do criticisms, right? And so it works nicely uh, into that as well. Sorry, Wes, I cut you off there. Well, it's okay. Sarah Selzer had posted a little bit ago about recommendations for creating discussion opportunities for math. Um, the ones you just gave are probably good in terms of thinking about terminology and using that. Um, it actually might tie in via segue um, for the an, another question that we had talked about, um, which I think I can post in here, involving peer evaluation. So, um, see if that works. What what suggestions do you have for for peer evaluation? Are there good or bad questions to include and avoid? And and is that Oh, is that a, a good way that you'd recommend as far as the interaction and getting students to respond to each other? Sure, and this probably depends on what grade you teach. Um, one suggestion for peer evaluation is just to hand them your rubric, the same rubric that you're grading the assignment on, have the student grade someone else on that. Um, it means they understand the rubric that they're being assessed on and it gives them some topics for them to assess and you don't have to create anything extra. I like when you can double up and not have to create extra assignments. So that's one thing you could use the rubric. Uh, another thing is to give them very specific questions. So a lot of times in peer evaluation, um, I'll say, okay, you were looking uh, in the introduction for the thesis statement. Does it answer these three things? And, or does it meet these qualifications? So you could ask very specific questions for them to, to answer and give that prompt, or you could just leave it more open-ended with that two stars and a wish, which I think works for a lot of different environments. Um, I did miss Ms. Freeland's question up here a long time ago, so I do want to get to it, which asked about encouraging students um, to come to their office hours so parents don't feel like they have to be teachers. Um, so I think that one thing you could do is maybe send an email to the parents uh, and remind them of those office hours or what they might be used for. Um, if you're not familiar with office hours, then you may not even know what they would be for, right? Um, Caleb told me today he thought the teacher had to ask you to come to the office hour, right? That they, they had to think something was wrong before you could go there. And I said, that's, that's not what it is. It's for you to come and ask questions if you're struggling with something. Um, and so, you know, maybe helping engage the parent in that or why it might be useful for the parent. Um, and I know I had a friend of mine who was upset because her son was having a hard time and he wanted her to really sit with him the entire time. And I said, have them go to the office hour. Don't do that. Don't buy into that. Go to the office. Hour. Tell them he has to go to office hours. Um, so maybe parents potentially, and I'm thinking more lower division here, but don't necessarily know the benefit of it or what it could be used for. So um, that would, honestly, that's probably where I would start with that. Just scrolling through to try to make sure I didn't miss anyone's questions as they came in. That's right. We're trying to give voice to all those. Um, Brianna Titus had made a good comment about Google Classroom. Brianna, would you elaborate a little bit on how discussion can work in the feed of Google Classroom if people are using that? Yeah, so if you go to the um, the questions, so if you're in your Google Classroom, you go to that second tab that has uh, classwork, I think it is. Of course, I don't have that tab open. Um, you can create a question. It, goes, it says create, and if you choose a question, you can either do a multiple choice question or you can have a short answer question. And then when you create that over on the right, there's a way to turn on students being able to view each other's responses and also being able to reply to each other's um, comments. And from what I can tell, I haven't used that. Like I have, I've had them uh, give me feedback using that question, but I haven't um, let them respond to each other yet. But when I looked it up, it does look like it creates threaded um, comments because that can sometimes be a mess if one person is responding to somebody else and your, you know, your conversation gets muddled. Um, it looks like it doesn't get muddled on there. So that's a good way, I think, to do a discussion question uh, within Google Classroom without having to open up a whole other program. Great. I think that's great. And the other thing I saw in Google Classroom that I didn't know, my new thing this week, is that you can assign um, assignments to the entire class or just to certain students. So when you are hitting assign, um, when it has all your students listed, if you just deselect some of your students, then it will only go to certain students. So if you're trying to create groups or just push assignment information to certain group um, or groups of students, you can do it that way. 
Sarah Selzer had asked specifically as far as math and discussions. So Jennifer, any, any thoughts there in terms of how you might get discussions going in, in upper division math? Um, okay. This is one, this one kind of putting me on the spot here. No. <laughs> um, I think so one, one, yeah, one thing that comes to mind, and maybe this, I'm going to talk my way through it and see if this works, um, would be if you posted a question that had um, like a math question that had lots of ways that you could solve it, lots of different options of going about it, and then have students show how they solve the problem and justify why that's the best way to do it potentially um, and and then someone else to be able to say no i think that this would have worked a lot better if you'd done this um, or if you posted a question and there's an error somewhere in the steps right if you you know showed um, the work and of a multi-step problem and there's a small calculation error somewhere uh, for the student to have to find that error um, and putting them in that teacher role of how they would help and correct that problem might be a way um, to include those discussions um, or talking about how this particular math skill could be used in the real world. I think that that might be something, right? Because uh, I think there are a lot of parents realizing that they maybe should have paid attention to their math class a little bit more now that they're <laughs> helping out at home. But, um, you know, what are some ways that that you might use this skill? So if you were working on percentages, uh, the student might come up with the example of like a sale that happens at, um, you know, when they're out shopping or something. And so they could have some discussions potentially um, of a way to to do that. And have a discussion around maybe a student example. So maybe not every student making a video, but even if with just their phone, having a sibling or a parent or somebody kind of record over their shoulder, maybe as they solve a problem and they talk through their process, you know, that video could become a discussion. I mean, you you mentioned the two stars and a wish, should, that could be used, but, you know, getting students, as you already said, to become the teacher and maybe teach a particular skill, and then having discussion around how they did it. And I like that idea too of maybe picking a problem that has several different ways to approach it, not necessarily just one, um, but maybe doing something something like that. Sarah, do you wanna follow up with that or uh, any uh, anything you wanna add since we took your question there? We're putting you on the spot now. You didn't know we were gonna <laughs> unmute your mic, you don't have to. Um, I. I can see um, applications for that in like some areas. So for example, um, like a discussion board for geometry proofs, right? So um, certainly the more complex the proof, the, there's a lot of different um, ways that you can attack the problem. Um, there are kind of other proof type things like in terms of, proving trig identities, those can be done multiple ways. So there are some students who could say, oh, I did it this way, or I did it this way, or maybe even for a really involved problem to say something like, I, um, I got started and then I'm getting stuck at this point. Does anybody yeah. have any recommendations? Um, but, those are the only ideas I can come up with. I'm, I don't know. I'm, I, I hear what you're saying about having that discussion element um, for each class to kind of mimic what they would have in a regular classroom. Um, and, and I'm struggling for ways to figure out how to do that authentically uh, for math. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think that discussion boards are going to work in every scenario, right? And and I do think that what you talk about being authentic is so important. Um, if you're just putting in a discussion there because someone told you that discussions work in online classes, then it's just busy work. And I don't think that that's a, a great strategy for anyone. I definitely wouldn't want to recommend that. Um, but but if there's an, a specific topic, um, so I use that as a cafe board is what I call that when students just have a Q&A ability. So it's not necessarily monitored by me where I'm going to go in and answer the questions, but instead where students are helping each other out and answering the questions. So, uh, you know, I'm struggling with this particular area or I can't find this information. Where is it? And they respond to each other in that cafe board. Um, as opposed to sending me that first email or that first private post that they have to go and ask someone else first. So that would be a way to use it. 
I want to ask you an email question because I know email can be very overwhelming. So can you can you speak just overall to how do you both encourage students to be asking questions when they have them and not just remaining quiet and sort of suffering in silence and not getting help and, and moving forward. And then, you know, the opposite extreme where you're getting an email every time something's submitted and, you know, checking and just too much. Any thoughts about that? That's a tough one, especially because the students you're dealing with weren't expecting to be remote learners. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, that's unfortunately, I think we're just going to see a big influx. And my classes that were face to face but are now online, they're emailing me all the time right now because it just wasn't what they expected. Um, I do think that the more on your assignment instructions that you can use chunks and headers to try to break apart the step-by-step -step instructions um, and clearly identifying that with a bold heading or you know changing that that font type or something that identifies that will help cut down on the number of questions um, and then you can help train your students and again this probably depends on age if it's faster just to answer the question or if it's faster to try to take time to train them that'll be you know your decision but um, if a student asks me like when is a particular assignment due instead of telling them the answer to the due date I tell them where to find the answer that information can be found on this page in the syllabus on the third column let me know if you can't find it but I, you know instead of just saying oh it's due on the 25th I want them to have to do the work of going and finding it and then that way the next time they have that same question they'll know where to go and look for it as opposed to emailing me go ahead Charlie Jennifer, that was my very favorite thing that I got from your video on that is that ability to to chunk information. The thing that I am seeing a lot of times, especially in the new Seesaw users and the Seesaw teachers, is it's so easy for teachers to give too much information, to give too many directions. And I really think the students are drowning in that. And then they just see it. And because I know that's what I do. When you see a bunch of words, you just you don't focus in on what it is. And I think the real challenge is is to to really identify uh, what it is that we want the kids to do and what is the very simplest way we can um, ask that or expect that or give that in our directions. And and I know that um, chunking that information is so critical. And I also what I liked about in that video you did was giving student examples. And I think that's what's really missing when we're not in a classroom together because when we're having a discussion together the students you were so right they listen to each other and they form their things from each other and that is just a missing piece in this and so they miss hearing each other's voices so that they can begin to develop their own and i think um, the power that i do love about seesaw is that the students can use their voice and they can explain things without having to always write it down. But the teacher is the only person that's benefiting from that or the parent. Um, and so I think whether we can transfer that to the blog or make a video explaining something or whatever, I think hearing from each other is critical, giving plenty of student examples so that they can see examples of what we are expecting them to do. Um, and even if that's just a small video clip, you know, the smaller the better, because again, if it goes beyond three minutes, the kids just pretty much check out too. So, I mean, that that's something that I'm really having to work on, and it's taking me some time, is to chunk my information, give minimal instructions, and then uh, making sure that I'm just very intentional about the specific skills I want without too much going on. Anyway. That was my rant for the day. No, I appreciate that. And I think that that is so important that we, you know, we chunk it down into smaller steps. Um, giving those due dates with that is important. Um, and then, you know, something else I talk about in that video is uh, if you can then, you know, give an overview of what the assignment is, then have them do something. If it's to go and read something or, um, you know, they have to go seek out information. And then I have students come back and watch a video from me because some of them are not going to read through all of my dis my discussion or my descriptions or my directions. That's what I'm really trying to say, directions. Um, they're just not going to. And then I try to really highlight with bold um, and changing the different headings of, about when things, you know, are a different topic for those students. Um, and that can help you know, maybe then be able to understand what it is. Um, 
when it comes to online instructions, if the student has to scroll to get through it, it's too much. So think about how they would see on their screen, and if they have to scroll, um, then you put too much. You want them to be able to see all of the instruction and directions in one screenshot, in one look at the screen. One of my favorite things for video too was digital portfolios. And so yeah. can you talk a little bit about what that might look like? Upper division, middle division, lower. Obviously we haven't been, I don't think a lot, you know, many of us have been doing this a portfolio the whole year, but like at this point, what, what might that look like? And you want to speak into a little bit of the why of that in case people didn't see that and just comment a little on what that could look like. Sure. So I talk about digital portfolios in alternative assessment video. Um, because I think that if we're going to get away from high stakes testing, um, which is a necessary, I think, in this environment, then we have to have another way for students to be able to prove what they learned. And I love portfolios because it forces students to be um, the decision maker, to be the active participant in this. So I like to set up um, criteria of what I wanted them to learn based off of the objectives for the semester. So these were the top five objectives for the semester before, and I think about it in the way of if I were sending them to the next grade, I need them to make sure and know these skills, right? These are the real big things that they have to make sure and know. And I set up, you know, around five-ish would probably work for most of the grades here. And then um, I allow students to pull whatever type of documentation they feel shows that they actually met those standards. Uh, so it really is a look back for them for the entire semester to say, okay, in this science lab, I was able to show um, how I know how to set up a lab correctly. But in this science lab, I did a better job of recording. And so they might pull you know, two different pieces of documentation there for them to prove their mastery of the whole idea of experiments. Um, in, in debate, in speech classes, one of the important skills for me is cooperation, and that a student not just, um, you know, come to me or just go to themselves, but that they go out and seek feedback from other people. And so for the cooperation requirement, I had students show where they'd gotten feedback from someone and then demonstrate how they use that feedback. So it might be some comments they received from a peer and then their final draft where they had incorporated those final comments. Um, so I think that on the platforms that you're currently using, so that you don't have to add anything else, um, if you're using Google Classroom, um, there is a, a way to support uh, a portfolio. It's sites.google, and it already has one of the options there is to do portfolio. So that it's already kind of built into Google Platform, which would be a really easy way to do it. Um, another easy way, like probably even much easier than that would just to be to use Google Slides as the portfolio. So the title slide is, you know, Jennifer Foster's portfolio for, um, you know, fourth grade language arts. And then my second slide is whatever that, that main objective that my teacher had, and then I, I put in that document. Um, I could put a link to something or I could, you know, just copy that document there um, into that Google slide. So then when the teacher was going through the presentation, then they would see each of those. You might also even have the students all come together and share then that Google slide presentation, right? Here are the things I'm the most proud of this semester, the things that I think really show how I understand and know these concepts through that that portfolio and I would say this is one of the things we're looking for be opportunities for for follow-on so we uh, we had an iPad workshop this morning about just tips and tricks and people talked about explain everything so we're gonna do an explain everything workshop next week maybe doing something about Google um, sites but I, I like the idea of slides because that's even simpler <clears throat> and I just encourage everybody to think about a template so make your slideshow if there are gonna be five things you have a uh, maybe a title slide, five main slides, and then a closing slide, but you can put on each slide what content you want, and then the kids can fill that in just like they would for a worksheet. So I think that's a great suggestion, and also the show and share, like Shelly's saying. Um, uh, and it doesn't let's... have to be new documents. It can be all things that they'd already created, um, and so it's a way for them to, you know, to show what they're proud of, and maybe that was, you know, something that, you know, that they did several weeks ago or even in the classroom before we went to remote learning but that they've still kind of proven that and then the last thing about portfolios i want to say is that every portfolio needs a reflection slide a last little reflective part um, and that could be either in video or through text but you want your students to um, to be reflective in kind of justifying why they think those things meet those standards 
Okay. Uh, Shannon has a question about body language and a lack of body language. Shannon, do you want to explain that a little bit? Sure. So when we started this, the first thing I noticed with the kids was that I allow a lot of talking in my classroom and I immediately noticed I wasn't getting that feedback from them. And so I didn't know whether when to move on from one topic to the next. And so I spent a lot of time um, saying, respond to this question in the chat or hold, raise your hand if you understand what I'm saying. And I don't always know that all 16 of those kids are truly ready to go on. And so and there may not be a, an answer to this, but are there other ways that you can read that, read your audience better in this kind of platform, especially when none of us are used to doing this? Sure. Um, I think that one option might be instead of saying, does anyone have questions to say, ask me two questions and force your audience to ask you questions. Because some of the hardest thing is to be the first person to ask a question. And that's why I had Wes and Sarah come up with some questions for today, some some pre you know ideas, because there's that silence like, well, I don't have a question. And if no one's going to ask one, I'm not definitely not going to be the first one to ask one. So I like to say, OK, now now that I've stopped here, let's take a break. I need two questions on this before we move on. And I'll just wait, <laughs> you know, that kind of classic, I'll wait concept. But um, then they'll ask me at least two questions and it very rarely is only two questions because someone has asked a question and now it's having and sparking that conversation. Um, so that's a really easy, just flip in your language that, that might help um, forcing them to ask some questions to you. Um, and then, you know, I think that you can still call on students, right? If you're worried that a student is is shut down or isn't engaged. Um, if you're gonna call on them in an online environment, I would suggest starting with their name before you say the question. So, okay, Shannon, I'm gonna come to you with this. And here's kind of what I'm talking about. All right, now Shannon, give me some, some thoughts on this. What, you know, what are your thoughts after I've talked about this? So they can mentally prepare themselves that they're gonna be put on the spot. Um, but, you know, we can read each other and know who's engaged and who's not, who's on another tab and <laughs> playing a game or something instead of being in your class. But, um, but I think that if you're going to ask them a question, I would start with their name, talk a little bit, and then give them a chance to respond. Kevin Hermanson has a question. Okay. Hey, Jennifer. Um, again, as Wes said, thanks so much for being here. My name is Kevin Hermanson. I'm an eighth grade U.S. history teacher. One of the things that um, in my class, it's kind of a culminating project. They do an end of the year research paper. And then I guess the best way to describe it is it's kind of like a science fair where they present uh, to an authentic audience their research and their discoveries. And they mostly have been doing poster boards, right? Um, well, obviously, you know, that's not possible. Uh, I was just really looking for any ideas or suggestions on platforms where students could uh, present public speaking about their research synchronously, um, you know, obviously Google Hangouts, um, but you know, where they could maybe present their screens with like a slideshow uh, and then have people kind of pop in and listen to them, um, you know, present on, on their topics or their discoveries. Uh, didn't know if you had any suggestions or, you know, uh, things that might work in that way. Yeah, I think this sounds like a really fun activity for students and such a great way for them to show their information. Uh, if you're wanting just a basic platform where, you know, they would get on and give information, go to meeting is one, right, where um, it's video and, and one person could present, obviously, what we're doing right now. Um, I think another option would be if you had the students do their presentations as a Google slide instead of a poster presentation. Uh, it kind of turns it more into that e um, you know, like if you were at a symposium and you're going and walking around at poster presentations, you could make them an e-poster presentation that way. Um, and then right. they could show them them that way through a Google slide might be a really easy way to do that. Um, if they wanted to create it all digitally that way, um, I guess a student could physically create the poster board still, and then they could record themselves just talking about it and doing that presentation, holding their a physical poster board if if having that physical poster board is important and I'm not I'm not 100% sure if it is or not um, yeah and I'm not I'm not super attached to that it's more just the um, the idea of like 
presenting and public speaking on the spot a little bit, which I think is important rather than like recording a video time and time again and getting it perfectly polished. Um, I don't know. And maybe I'm too attached to that. I, I'm, I'm not, you know, sold that that's the way that it has to be, but just looking for some suggestions. And I, I think that's super helpful. So I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I am attached to public speaking big time. So I say you you stay attached to that. I think that that's a great <laughs> skill. Um, um, and no, I think that, um, you know, having some sort of, you know, meeting where the students are having to live present it is valuable. If you're going to do that, I would go ahead and take some time to talk about students on framing, right? Um, you'll get students in their bedroom and they're sitting on their bed and, you know, it's just not going to come across as being as professional. Um, mm -hmm. So when I teach students to, to speak online, I do talk about framing, what's in your background. Um, right. Do I want them standing or is sitting okay? Um, right. And so I would spend some time, you know, thinking about those requirements on that. Okay. Um, but I think that, yeah, you could you could do something where you were just kind of at a meeting. Um, I, I don't, Wes, you might be able to know, do you guys have a big blue button? It's a great option for this, but I don't. Yeah, we're using primarily Google Hangout Meets and then this GoToMeeting is available. Um, Kevin, one thing I thought of that we could do is we could create different rooms, and so we could you could jigsaw that. So you could have yeah, you no know, presentations and have students on a you know on a 15 minute schedule or something. I mean, you could you could do something where they were going around and they were going to have to share. Uh, I don't know if that's jigsaw or there's another strategy for that, but it's expert groups. But basically, where you know students are going to rotate around and they're going to share. So that that would allow you to get some live interaction versus like telling everybody to record a screencast and then they just had to you know listen to each other and give feedback without being live. Yeah, I think well, a lot of the West thing, all those yeah. training groups that you could establish okay. training groups for them to uh, jump into other groups. Zoom. That's exactly what I was thinking about doing. So I guess yeah. I could just do different uh, Google Hangouts. Like I was even thinking about doing it on a Google Doc, like with different Google Hangouts um, and then having kids yeah. jump in and out. We're having good conversations about, about Zoom um, and there's, <laughs> there's going to be some some meetings I think later this week. And one of the difficulties is when we don't pay for it, we don't have anything, we don't have any recourse if there's a problem and there's a difference in the enterprise paid version of Zoom versus just the free one. But um, I have been using personally for a, a men's group at church this last Friday morning, we did a, um, you know, 7 a.m. Uh, with breakout rooms. And that was very cool because we had like 40 guys there and then we all broke out into separate rooms. Right. So can we, we can connect a little bit later. And does anybody else have any thoughts about that? Who, who's in the room here thinking about kids presenting live and wanting to present to each other and kind of recapturing that? So that's a great question. We can continue that conversation. All right, well, we have about 10 minutes left till the top of the hour. Please continue to put questions that you that you have into into the chat. We've got some other ones that we can kind of uh, begin to divide. Uh, one I'm specific... scrolling back through just to make sure I didn't miss anybody's back at the top. But yeah, go ahead and Wes with yours. Oh, uh, one of the one I think Sarah put this one in. What was the name of the author of the book Netiquette? I think you mentioned that in video four. Yeah, so this is an old book, um, but it's kind of the Bible when it comes to netiquette. It's Virginia Shea, S-H-E-A. Um, and it was written like in 94 or something. Um, but, but that idea that we have to teach students how to have etiquette online. And so they call that netiquette uh, with an N. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so making sure that you pay attention to, you know, remembering that it's a person and that whatever we write or say or post, even though it's virtual, is still going to a human being. And, and we have to constantly remind people about that. Um, and people just write such terrible things online because they lose sight of the fact that we're still dealing with people. So it's a great resource for that. Or if you just search Netiquette um, with her name, then you can kind of get some of the top tips. And a lot of universities have created um, handouts to use with your students on that. Here's a question that was in there. You mentioned rubrics or I, and just with projects and assessments, rubrics came up. So any just advice on either tools or building rubrics um, as you work with, with teachers and faculty who are, who are building rubrics, any, any tips come to mind about how to keep them simple, but also, I know you mentioned objectives multiple times and how important those are. So. <laughs> My, my husband totally made fun of me. He goes, let me guess, should we start with objectives? <laughs> 
Yes, actually. Um, okay, so when it comes to rubrics, I would say make it um, accessible to the students that you're teaching. So if you're teaching lower division students or middle school division students, it shouldn't be written for your administrator. It should be written for your student. And I think so often people write rubrics based off of what they're expecting kind of administrators or, um, or a fellow teacher to want in a rubric, but really the rubric should be about communicating the expectation to the student and then making it easy for you to grade and provide feedback to your student. So think about it from a feedback perspective also. So I want my student to know these things about their work and those are the types of things that I would include in my comments um, in each of the rubric columns. One of the things that comes to mind, back to what Kevin was talking about with live presentations, when I was adjuncting at UCO, <clears throat> we had, I had my students do Ignite presentations, which were 20 slide, uh, 20 seconds of slide presentation, so it was five minutes, but then we used a Google form that students would fill out, and then it had a, a, some basic rubric questions that they would fill out. So anyway, depending upon how that happens, whether you're having students evaluate offline, not live, um, I know that you can use that Google form as a way to, you know, communicate your rubric, but then you can also have students peer, peer evaluate. Um, if anybody has a rubric tool, I know there's just, there's different ones that are out there. I've just usually made a table inside a Google document. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so Google Classroom has rubrics in it now. Um, and so you can create it directly in there if you're wanting to. And then, um, and then yes, this is a good in the chat here. This is a great resource for creating rubrics. Yeah, Stephanie. Okay, I thought of another question uh, on the math. My Cassidy has rubrics. Oh, that's good. Very smart of my Cassidy. Um, what on the math discussion board? Um, another question that I thought of was that you might be able to ask them um, how the way that I checked my work. So how did I? How did you go back and check your work today to know that it was the right answer? And then they could be reflective in how they answered. You know, and went back and checked it, not just. Um, the process that they went through, but how did they know that it was right? I don't know. I'm working on that math one. That's going to get me. <laughs> I'm going to think of some discussions you can use in math. Here's a here's a chat question. So you talked about the ways that students collaborate when they're working in groups, um, having a place to do that. I don't know if anybody has has used that, and if everybody's students have discovered this, but you know, inside a Google document, there's a way to have a chat to the side. Um, there is an app that we have right now open for upper division. I don't think it's turned on for middle or lower, but any thoughts about that in terms of collaboration? When, when you want students to work in groups, um, what do you think are some of the best spaces, you know, depending upon their age or grade, to be able to, to work together collaboratively? I think whatever you already have is the best place to do it. I wouldn't go outside and get something else. Um, it's another login for students. And the farther outside of whatever LMS you're using, the less control you have over it. And the less control you have, the more likely it's going to be not about the topic at hand and more about Fortnite. Um, and so, you know, I think that that trying to to keep that where the teacher has access to it. So anytime I have a chat or a discussion, I'm also a member of that uh, so that I can join in. I don't want to be a part of the conversation, but I want students to know that I am present there so that it stays professional and it stays on topic. Um, and I think whether or not you should turn it on for the lower grades is probably up to the teachers. If I were teaching, I would want it on because I think that it is such a great way to organically have that collaboration. I do think it cuts back on the number of emails that I receive as a teacher when they can ask each other questions. Um, and it provides um, that organic thing that happens in the classroom where you know they're walking out and they're talking about it. Uh, and that conversations that they're having is helping moving those those thoughts into long-term memory it's making them more meaningful and connected for themselves um, so i i like chat i do think that it's it's a good function brianna you mentioned in the chat about uh rubrics and my Cassidy. could you share a little bit what what have you been able to do and is that is that something you found helpful i i just um i've had rubrics for some of the the you know assessments i've done this year and so uh, on the assessment, the actual assessment on the back, I printed the rubric so that, that when they were done, they could check and see if they thought that they had met all of those object objectives and met all of those um, 
you know, levels. And then when I went to put it in the computer, I also had the exact same rubric attached to each one. So if a parent wanted to, they could go in and actually like click and see how their kid did on each of those um, things that I was looking for. And I, I wanted to talk about that group work because um, we language teachers have been talking about this where we'd like to have like five minute breakout sessions where the students talk to each other and kind of be able to walk around. And I know that I've read that Zoom does that and I've read a lot of teachers doing that on Zoom and I know we can't do Zoom, but um, is there any way to have that video chat, not just text chat, but a video chat component? Because that's so important for, for language, for students to be talking to each other. I mean, we're definitely having conversations about how we can license Zoom and what that looks like for us to have that as a licensed tool. Um, that, that There's a conversation happening tomorrow about that actually um, with administrators. Uh, we can create other rooms so you could you could make a google doc and you can you can go ahead and create google meets and you could have four different rooms and then use that doc with students names underneath and then you can jump you know back and forth in between them the thing about google meets and they've done some really good things but it's it's still this is still a thing that if you create it, it is a persistent room that doesn't end. And that's one of the nice things about using the, the Hangout Meets from your Google Classroom is that that one only uh, is open for students when you open it. And then if as long as the kids leave and you're the last person in it, it closes. Uh, but I think we should definitely explore that because we we want need our students to be able to work in smaller groups that the dynamics are just different. You have any thoughts about that, Jennifer? What you mentioned odd numbers for groups. Any other thoughts just in terms of grouping sizes and how how do you there's a good one. How do you overcome the the I'm gonna just kind of skate along, you know, obviously you're play into that, but do you have thoughts on sizes of groups and addressing those issues? Um I like threes and fives when it comes to groups. Um I do think odds are good because if they are having to come to a consensus, then they could just take a vote and one side is going to win. I also like smaller groups. That's why I like three, um, because you're not waiting for a long time for people to come in and reply and give feedback. It, it just seems like it goes faster as a result. Um, and, and what was your other question? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I've been well, talking a like lot. The kids that are going to maybe just. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah along or whatever I mean making sure that people are carrying their weight um, I think that that comes up with uh, determining what are the roles and we talk about group dynamics uh, we might talk about the listener or the leader or the questioner and I don't really mean it as far as roles as that goes in group dynamic theory but more in what is each person going to be held responsible for um, is everyone going to be expected to create the Google slide is everyone going to be expected to um, to talk in the presentation or can each person or different people um, be you know be responsible for different parts of that so I would be really clear in the expectation for each individual student um, contribution uh, and then I'm a big fan and I know this can get controversial but I'm a big fan of individual grade and group grade when it comes to groups um, because I think that you need to be held accountable for being able to collaborate if you're doing it as a group then the group component collaboration needs to be you know, a, a graded part of it. That that was a goal of the assignment. So I would make that a part of it. I wouldn't weight it as heavily in case you do have a major slacker in your group and you're just totally frustrated. But um, but I do think that that the group itself needs to be accountable for coming together and, and making that that justification as a group. Good. Shelly, do you want to share real quick what you put into chat about meeting with the small groups after your live meeting? Yeah, we've really enjoyed having the um, the go to meeting classroom where we have our virtual classroom and each day we have a morning meeting from 930 to 10 and ahead of time I invite um, three students um, so that I make the fourth uh, it, because I can see all of those speakers on their iPads uh, to stay after on the meeting and I put a timer on my phone and for about five minutes we just chat we talk. Um, and it's been great, especially for, for some of my students, because we try to make our morning meetings really interactive and we're sharing questions and we have questions, but we still don't get a whole lot of feedback um, from everybody. But I found when I do that, um, it's great community building. And now I'm on the process, I'm on my second round of doing this and I'm mixing up the groups. So I started with students that I knew they were really comfortable with first. 
and then now I'm mixing up the groups, but I have one student that's nonverbal and she won't say a thing in a group meeting. But when we got her into a group with two of her little friends, it was nonstop talking. She talked and talked and talked and it was really fantastic because that was a huge thing for her. Um, so anyway, it just gives the kids an opportunity to um, show me, show, show and tell. You know, today the boys, I had a group of boys and they were all sharing their Lego toys and they run and they get their Legos and they show you what they've made. And, and it's just, it's been a wonderful time. Um, and I think the parents appreciate it because these kids are starting to get lonely. When I did my social emotional this morning, a lot of the responses I got, they're tired and they're lonely. And, and that just made my heart sad. And so I think spending that extra time in their social emotional time is huge. And then you could also later do it for more of an academic thing. Um, but now they're used to it, you know, so it's not like, oh, the teacher wants to talk to me. What did I do wrong? Now it's like, oh, the teacher wants to talk to me. It's my turn, you know. And so it's, it's worked out well. That's fabulous. Because, yeah, we are in a state of Maslow over Blooms, right? We're having to take care of those just needs that students have. Um, and, and I think that that's so valuable that, that you're meeting those needs of your students. Awesome. Um, I don't know if the person who asked the question about um, presentations is gone or not. But one suggestion I might have is contact your um, book rep. Uh, and I don't know how you all communicate with your book reps, but most publishers have platforms to do that, um, what you're talking about in those presentations already available. Um, so if, if you're looking at, you know, like McGraw-Hill, for example, their tool is called Speech Capture and Cengage has UCU. So depending on your book publisher that you're already using, those tools would be available. Well, please join me in giving a virtual round of applause to Jennifer for this wonderful breakout session and I want to just close by reminding everybody that we have a couple other opportunities so on Friday there's going to be another time but this one will be during uh, earlier in the day starting at 10 30 and so if uh, whether you've watched all the videos or not uh, you'd like to come back for more we'd love to uh, have you come back and just continue the conversation because it's really not just about what Jennifer has said it's also just where we're finding challenges and where we want to grow and you know the, the questions that we have so that is going to be at 10 30 on Friday uh, April 24th and then if you are using Seesaw particularly lower and primary but we've got some other teachers tomorrow at 1 so right after lunch we're going to have a webinar about choice boards and that is something that a number of teachers are starting to use in activities uh, being able to have a selection of different things that students might you know might choose one they might choose all but anyway that's a way to design what jennifer you know just been talking about with with asynchronous activities and and students uh having choices there so jennifer any concluding thoughts you'd like to leave us with as we end our day you were doing great and you were teaching during a crisis. And so the, the feelings that you are having are all legitimate. Um, don't get too bogged down on the bells and whistles of making you know all the things happen. Focus in on the objectives and what you truly want your students to learn these last few weeks. And then let's work together. Um, Wes is such an excellent resource here for you guys. And, and I'm here for you too, especially as a Cassidy parent. I just want to see this be successful for you and your students. But um, so let's work together and figure out what's the easiest way to make that happen for you since you're doing it remotely. But you guys are awesome teachers. You're already doing a great job. So keep keep doing that. <laughs>